Hello again, I am Blunty, and this, this monster, this beast from the blackest corners of the forest of eternal polygon punishment, this pixel pornography, is the newest incarnation of NVIDIA's GeForce GTX 990 Ti from Gigabyte. It's from their newest line of cards, all labelled Extreme Gaming, spelled in the fashion of 1996 with a big fat X and the E dropped all together because, well, when you're this goddamn extreme, three E's all in one word is only dead weight. It's wasteful. You don't have time for three E's when you're extreme. <laughs> now... The 980 Ti cards themselves have been around since the middle of this year, so I'm not going to be digging into much of what the 980 Ti is at its most basic level. In this video, I'll just be focusing on this particular flavor of the card from Gigabyte. But it, of course, has all the standard 980 Ti stuff. The slightly cut back brain from a Titan X, 6 gigabytes of GDDR5 RAM at 7 gigahertz, and while the stock clocks on a reference 980 Ti board are 1000 megahertz boosting to 1075 megahertz and most third-party units come out of the box with moderate overclocks somewhere in the shallow end of 1100 megahertz the extreme gaming edition of the 980 ti here is faster than most of them in its slowest eco mode in its default overclock gaming mode it ticks in at a base clock of 1216 megahertz boosting to 1317 in its preset performance overclock mode it pops in at 1241 megahertz boosting to 1342 megahertz and there's still room to push it even further with a manual overclock. The GPU chip itself having been picked out of Gigabyte's gauntlet system, so only the best of the best overclockable chips make it into their high-end cards. But we'll get to all the overclocking stuff a little bit later. To start with, we're going to be dealing with this card in its default, out-of-box overclock. What is labelled in Gigabyte's OC Guru 2 software as simply gaming mode. It's typically gigabyte understated and kind of elegant. Though I do have to point out, the shroud wrapping around the fans and side of the card is unusually flimsy. No other gigabyte card I've played with has felt like this. So a little care does have to be taken while handling and installing it, lest you risk bending the metal shroud out of place slightly. That said though, of course, this isn't an ongoing issue, is it? Once it's in your machine, it's not a bother. You're not going to be touching it all the time. Unless, of course, you're swapping out cards on a regular basis, and then, well, you just need to treat it with a little extra delicacy. Not a deal breaker, but I do got to mention it, don't I? Oh, and it's a very hefty card too, of course, so the droop... Well, the droop is real, folks. Aside from that though, it, along with the other extreme gaming versions of various other NVIDIA GTX cards, has a light up logo, which, unlike my GTX 970 G1 edition, which is annoyingly blue only, inside my black and red rig. Here in the extreme gaming family though, it's a full RGB LED, so you can ping it to whatever shade or hue matches the rest of your build. And yes, you can make it flash or throb or dance to the music, and you can have it as bright or as dim as you like. And while I know the camera here makes it look like it's a slightly different shade of red than the rest of my system, that's something quirky going on with the camera sensor there. When you look at it with a human eye, I have actually got the hue matched properly. <laughs> And alongside the light-up logo, though in most standard rigs you may never even see it, for modders and for some specialist cases designed to show off your graphics cards, each of the fans has a ring of RGB illumination around it too. And on the subject of the fans, the keen-eyed may have spotted that the centre one counter-rotates. It spins opposite to the other two. Now, Gigabyte claim that this produces even more efficient cooling across the significant mass of heatsink fins, which is a tough claim to properly test here in any practical sense, but as we'll get to in a moment, regardless of whether or not it's due to the counter-rotation gimmick or just a superb cooler design in general, this card stays amazingly well thermally behaved. And in fact, when it's not being asked to work hard, the fans stop altogether. There's even a light on the card to let you know at a glance if the card is even bothering to spin up the fans at all. There's a couple of other physical differences between this and most other 980 Ti's out there. While the stock design calls for one 8-pin and one 6-pin power feed, this beastie wants both 8-pin feeds. And for those of you who want to go cuckoo bananas with your overclocking, there's a third power input at the back for another 6-pin feed, right next to the dual BIOS switch for the most serious overclockers out there with tanks of liquid nitrogen at your workbench and menace in your eyes. And lastly, of course, there's the lovely super clean and crispy backplate. 
I do like a nice backplate, don't you? Now, stick the thing in a PC and glorious things start to happen. Of course, it's an overclocked 980 Ti, so you're not going to be horribly shocked when I tell you that it runs games really, really well. But first, he teased, the requisite benchmark stuff. Throwing an extreme HD Unigen Valley benchmark at it, spat back an average of 95 frames per second, peaking at 117 and scoring 39.69. The Heaven Extreme benchmark similarly posted no great challenge, 120 frames per second average, peaking to 265 and scoring 3027. And to put that into some sort of useful frame of comparison for you, the Radeon R9 Nano itself, much like the 980 Ti being a slightly cut pack version of the flagship model, and my favourite high-end enthusiast GPU from the Red team on the other side of the fence, scored 2724 and 1829 on the same tests. The Firestrike benchmarks tell the same kind of story. Basically, nothing short of a multi-card SLI setup can really match what a single 980 Ti can do. And again, for the sake of giving you a useful frame of reference, the small but brutally impressive R9 Nano sits well in the shadow of the 980 Ti monolith. Now, benchmarks done with. Wonderful things for e-penis measuring, yes, but as many of you know, to me, it's all about how it plays real games. And there's no point dicking around here, is there? It's a big boy, so we'll throw Tomb Raider at it with ultimate settings, every last bell and whistle and fancy graphical trick in 1080p. <laughs> and it's unstoppable, a minimum of 120 FPS, averaging to 153, which means those of you fortunate enough to have those fancy 144Hz monitors can pull out all the pretty stuff, team it with G-Sync, and holy gods, the flawless eyeball glory awaits you. So, how about 4K? Without an SLI setup, even a monster like this will be turning a couple of things down a smidge. And after doing that, you'll still be pulling in frame rates into the triple digits, which means if you're on a 60Hz monitor, you can start turning things up again if you like. Now, I didn't spend much time fiddling to find the perfect balance of settings and frame rate here, but clearly there is loads of room to breathe, even all the way up at 4K. I tried Fallout 4 next, a game that has sucked large sections of my days away in the past couple of weeks, as I suspect it has for many of you. And as you may know, some of the physics in this game is tied, in Bethesda's cute old-fashioned way, to the frame rate. So on PC, it is locked at 60 frames per second. And out of curiosity, I did use a modding tool to unlock that frame rate to see what the 980 Ti would do to it. And on the menu screen, I got a very amusing 1300-ish FPS. In game, everything maxed out, it was pushing between 130 and 150 frames per second. Which means, of course, back in the world of the locked frame rate normal experience, even with everything absolutely maxed out, the card is hardly even breaking a sweat. In fact, there's so much headrooms, the fans barely spin at all. And although Bethesda are inept enough to have a UI overlay that does not scale properly if you do this, it is possible to make Fallout 4 run in 4K, which, thanks to the spazzy interface scaling, is close to unplayable in any proper way, but I suppose it does make for some nice screenshot fodder. And once more, out of curiosity more than practicality, I pushed it up to 4K and, you guessed it, nearly flawless performance. There was only one setting I had to turn down from ultra to high in order to get 4K running at a nice consistent 60 frames per second. And that was, of course, the notorious God Rays option, already well known to be an absolute frame rate killer, regardless of what other settings you're using on any GPU. And frankly, I can't really see the difference between ultra and high settings on God Rays anyway, so who cares? But the point is, if Bethesda, or more likely some clever clogs modder out there, ever fix the user interface overlay stuff to work properly in 4K, the Gigabyte 980 Ti Extreme Edition is clearly the monster you want pushing this game into 4K. Alright then, so I guess we can move on to the only other game people seem to be talking about right now, Star Wars Battlefront. 1080p, every last thing dialed up all the way. No bother, of course. You may as well be asking the card to run Pac-Man or something. The 980 Ti Extreme Edition swallows it whole. In 1440p, same maxed out ultra settings, everything turned all the way up, and you're still living in a world that flows to you in triple digit frame rates.
And then asking it for 4K, things get really quite exciting, because this is what it does with 4K. Even if I ask it to keep all the maxed out ultra settings. Only the most nitpicky players may be concerned that the frame rate dips below 60 to as low as 50-ish. At least on most maps anyway. I started here because this was the map I did a lot of testing on with a few different graphics cards during the game's beta. So here is where I was most familiar with the performance. But then I kicked over to the map based on the forest moon of Endor. That's right, geek poses. It is not Endor. This is the forest moon of Endor. See, this is how you separate the real Star Wars nerds from the Jar Jar apologist posers. <laughs> Anyway, on this much more graphically demanding map, 4K in ultra settings can drag down the frame rate a little bit more. But even then, it's only briefly dipping into the 40s, which in my book is still friggin' impressive. You might even call it playable, but let's be real. That frame rate is playable for the more relaxed gamer. Perhaps you'd even slap them with some super bizarre label like casual. But casual gamers don't buy cards like this, do they? <laughs> So let's pull things down one more notch to 4K at high settings. Here, we're still dipping just a little bit below 60, but never past the low 50s, and we spike up into the mid 70s. So maybe turn one more thing down, slap on G-Sync, and bazam, Star Wars Battlefront in eye-wateringly pretty 4K, and silky smooth 60 frames per second. Who could ask for more? And yes, I know I haven't uploaded this particular video in 4K because what I'm showing you is a mix of 1080p and 4K and 1440p, so 1080p is just the best way to publish it. So you can't really see for yourself here, but man, this game looks amazing in 4K. Maybe I'll put up some of the raw gameplay I recorded for this review separately in 4K so you can check it out. But back to the review in progress. All right, so it's impressive. In fact, it's very impressive. And a reminder, all of that was at the stock out of box overclock and there is an even faster overclock available at the tick of a checkbox if you want to push things just a little bit further so taking things into my own hands with a manual overclock i pushed the clock to 1254 megahertz and 1355 boost while the memory speed sucked in almost a full extra gigahertz without the slightest struggle and there was still room to go further on the memory by the way but there's only minimal benefit to doing that so i left it at the nice round number of 8 gigahertz also worth noting, of course, that this is all with the stock cooler. Those of you set up for nitro cooling or custom water blocks and the like can use the extra power input and the secondary BIOS to push this card to the absolute physical limits. The air-cooled overclock that I achieved here is by no means the limit. But out of the box, just punching in some numbers and running some load testing, I got a rock-stable overclock of more than 25% over stock 980 Ti clocks. And... I did that without making the card any louder. It didn't need to spin up the fans any more than normal. Which brings us to the fan noise. The card is very quiet. Utterly silent, as a matter of fact, when under load loads, thanks to the fans stopping altogether. And when in-game, even over long sessions of 4K gaming and even benchmarking loads, I never once heard the fans spin up to maximum. But for your own ears, here is what it sounds like. So even at its loudest, it's remarkably quiet. And once again, in any real world use case I had, it never even got that loud. At its most stressed, it was somewhere around 60% fan speed, judging by the noise it was making. And in any test I had, I never saw temperatures climb past 82 degrees Celsius. And mostly when it was under loads, it sat happily in the low to mid 70s. On top of this, it exhausted heat efficiently enough that even my system's case fans never needed to spin up past my quiet idle settings to move out whatever heat the card was pushing into the case anyway. And the last noise factor, coil wine. It can be made to produce some moderate coil wine, but the only time I even heard it was when I was deliberately trying to generate some by running a very low-end system benchmark tool to force the card to wind up frame rates to the 5 to 800 mark. Far, far beyond any practical use case, but here's what it sounds like.
And here's what the cart sounds like when I ask it to run Fallout 4 utterly maxed out. Now the fan stop indicator light is off, which is the only real way I can tell the fans are actually spinning at all because they're only needed at a very low speed here. When the side panel is on my case, I can barely hear it at all. The Gigabyte Extreme Gaming 980 Ti is, in a word, glorious. So much power, so quiet, so well behaved, and frankly, it's a bit pretty while it's at it. And now I've seen both ends of Gigabyte's GTX line, from the OC edition of the GTX 950 I reviewed a few months back, to the G1 Gaming Edition of the GTX 970 I've built my own gaming rig with, and now to the top end, the Extreme Edition GTX 980 Ti, and I have this to say. Gigabyte have never, not once, not even for an instant, left me anything but impressed with their hardware. The newest WinForce coolers are fantastic, the cards look great, and thanks to Gigabyte's gauntlet system, they overclock like a boss. And this new flavour of 980 Ti has left my favourable opinion of Gigabyte utterly unchanged, of course. They've done a very impressive job of giving the most dedicated of enthusiast PC gamers a card that does nothing but kick teeth in from the moment you install it. And it provides some very desirable roads for the hobbyist overclocking crowd to explore. And aside from the slight flimsiness of the shroud, which as I said is hardly an issue unless you're swapping cards out on a regular basis, and even then, just be a bit gentle, I don't think there's anything else I'd change about the 980 Ti Extreme Edition from Gigabyte. It is nothing less than splendid. But thanks for watching, I am Blunty and I'm gonna go before the hammering that my neighbour is making while I'm trying to record this is driving me insane. I hope you guys haven't been too distracted by it. <laughs> Shut up over there, please! I'm trying to record and do the video thing for the friendly YouTube people. Ah, catch you next time.